Welcome to the show. I'm your host, Dr. Mike Wall. Well, we started the show the first day of the lockdown, and since then, a lot has changed. It's been a year of changes in everything we do, how we work, how we play, and how we focus on our health. Today, I have four guests, all experts in their own areas of health, to share with us how they saw their fields change during a year that we'll all look back on as the year the world shut down. In the first part of the show, we're joined by Dr. Shannon Edison, who's a clinical psychologist and a director at the Beacon Center, a private practice here in St. John's. She'll talk about how our mental health was impacted this year. In the second part of the show, we have fitness expert Jill Whalen, who helps thousands of people improve their wellness through her online platform. Next, we have a colleague of mine from the university, Dr. Rod Russell, who's a professor of virology and immunology, and he'll walk us through how the virus mutated and the amazing advances in vaccines that we saw this year. Last, but definitely not least, we have our province's own Dr. Janice Fitzgerald, who reflects back on everything we've learned about public health this past year. We have a lot to cover, so let's get to it. Hi, Dr. Edison. Welcome to the show. Hi, Mike. Thanks so much for having me. Oh, I'm really excited you're here because we are talking about all the things that have changed this year and psychology is your field of study. But before Mm -hmm. we get into all the sort of shifts that we've seen in mental health this year, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Absolutely. Yeah. So I am a clinical psychologist. I did my PhD in clinical psychology uh, in Ontario, but I'm originally from Newfoundland and moved back to Newfoundland about 10 years ago. And uh, I am one of the directors at something called the Beacon Center, which is a private practice here locally in in St. John's. So at the Beacon Center, I do a number of different things. I do therapy with individuals and families and couples and uh And I teach some courses online and uh, do public speaking when I can and some teaching when I can. Well, that's excellent. That's that's great. You're going to fit right into being here, one of the guests and being able to share all your ideas. We're actually going to talk about the course that you've just developed a little bit later on in this episode. But, you know, we got to set the stage here. Uh, We've talked about, you know, physical health and we've talked about how public health has changed. But, you know, mental health is something that a lot of people it's become front and center in their lives Um, Mm -hmm. over the over the last year. What are the biggest sort of shifts you've seen uh, in in that? And has it sort of evolved throughout the year? I think when we think about any type of crisis, you know, the experience of fear and anxiety is inevitable. So it's not surprising that that's been a, you know, a strong response that people have had. You know, they're really natural and normal responses to any challenging situations that, you know, come with any danger or uncertainty, which, of course, this pandemic has had a lot of that. I mean, unfortunately, the referral rates for, you know, mental health have been on the increase. You know, they've been increasing as of late anyway, but, you know, consistent with with research, you know, that's that's coming out more recently around the impact on mental health with COVID. We at our at the Beacon Center, we're noticing an increase in referrals. Same thing at Eastern Health. There has been an increase, both in terms of new referrals for mental health services, but also in terms of we're noticing a lot of clients coming back re-referring for services that maybe hadn't been seeing somebody for quite some time, but things have changed and they're struggling more and they're coming back. So seeing that, and I think in general, you know, when I'm talking with just public groups and obviously the topic of mental health comes up, many things get discussed. And and a lot of people are kind of even making comments around the fact that this has been a really stressful year. And even if they're not necessarily experiencing a decline in mental wellness to the point that they feel they need to seek services. Most people in general are talking about just feeling that they're just not at their best, you know, that everybody feels like this has been a really hard year and and there's been struggle. It's really shone quite a strong light on the importance of connection in almost every therapy session I have regardless of the age of the person that I'm meeting with, it's almost always the case that we're talking about the topic of connection, you know, so that's, that's, you know, that's, I think, really highlighted how important it is for us to have connection, and what some of those losses of connection have meant for us. Um, Of course, you know, another really big theme that comes up is, is uncertainty, you know, when we think about mental health, especially when we think about anxiety, 
a really big trigger for for feelings of fear is not being able to predict how things are going to unfold. You mm -hmm. know, typically we can make some estimates at least of what we're going to be doing in six months time. You may even be just planning when you're going to see certain family members next, you know, a, a vacation you might be taking. And all of a sudden people got catapulted into this world where they were having to really have no ability to predict what the next number of months were going to look like. Mm -hmm. um, so people were having to really sit on that fear and not be able to kind of try to gain some control over it, which is what we often do when we're worried. We try to plan and control. And with our experiences with COVID, we, we haven't been able to do that. And so people have been having to, having to just kind of stay with that uncertainty and we don't like doing that in general. So it's a hard, a hard ask for all of us. Right. And I can mm -hmm. imagine that I've got some family that's not from here. So being able mm -hmm. to see them for the first time in a long time, some very close family, like my mother lives in New Brunswick right? and, and, you know, having trips and, and weddings and everything else people were excited about. Did you see things around like kids being home and having to be homeschooled or partnerships struggling because they're relying 100% on mm -hmm. each other when they normally had external stimulus. How has that sort of shown up in your practice? Oh my goodness, so much. I, I mean, I think, you know, it's been really interesting to just look at even this, the concept of expectations, you know, that I think people have had self expectations of being able to do much more than would typically be asked of them. And then you know, also feeling that external pressure to do more things again. So, you know, expectations coming from elsewhere, but there's no question about it that, you know, many of my clients are talking about the competing demands of trying to teach their children at home while still maintaining, you know, the same uh, level of work that they've been doing before. Children that have any particular needs really found online schooling so difficult and parents aren't equipped. They don't have the education degrees. They don't have all those skills that, that teachers bring forward. I think there's been a lot of appreciation in this last year for the value of teachers and just how much, how skilled they are when parents have been trying to, to help their kids kind of do things at home. Um, you know, so, so many different ways that People have really experienced a lot of, a lot of strain, a lot of worry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yeah. if you think about a lot of individuals listen to this show, obviously are interested in their health. There's a lot of people mm -hmm. out there that have operations or procedures or things that have to be put off because they might not be critically important at this point, but that can Absolutely. cause a lot of stress and discomfort for people too. So, you know, for anybody listening out there, it's nice that things are coming back to mm -hmm. a, a new normal and starting to get back online. And that's yes. one thing that I want to talk to you about, because I know you're a yeah. big advocate for not just dealing with things when they're not great, but you're mm -hmm. also a very, you have a very positive approach in the way that you, you deal with psychology with people. Have there been any pros to this year about, you know, what we've gone through that has actually helped our mental health in certain ways? Yeah, there absolutely have, you know, the, I think a lot of people are, are feeling somewhat hesitant lately to talk about the positives, just trying to be mindful of, you know, the hardships that people have experienced. And at the same time, it is okay for us to balance the fact that there have been hard things and some positive things as well. Even, you know, when you'd asked earlier about how things might have changed over this last year, just even looking at our, our, our resilience, you know, in Newfoundland, obviously, we had the second wave and so restrictions increased again and and I think people adapted more quickly to that um, they didn't necessarily have more resources so that was a challenge but they did move into okay this is how I get groceries this is how I will kind of I need to create a schedule this time you know kind of some of those lessons learned of okay I've got to I've got to make sure that I'm getting fresh air I've got to find a way to keep exercise built in so I think we're learning a lot about ourselves and what our needs are which is wonderful because it means that we're learning about how to improve our mental wellness. Just like you said, Mike, just thinking about what's wrong, but being able to identify, okay, you know, in this last year, I've learned a lot about what's really critical for my well being and some things that I want to make sure that I continue to build on and uh, so that I can improve my life. So, to go from, I think what we've often been experiencing this last year is a lot of kind of just surviving. You know, often when you're in a crisis, you kind of almost just kind of bury down, you just uh, bear down, you just kind of get through the day. And now that we're starting to have vaccinations and 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 starting to be able to kind of see some more changes in the future, 
I think there's a lot more possibility for us to start thinking about, okay, how can I move from surviving to thriving, right? And so I learned some important things about myself in this last year of what's what some of those key things are. And now I want to build, you know, build on that. I'm starting to kind of get some of that more mental space to be able to do that and to think more positively. And, you know, there's been a lot of, a lot of changes. A lot of families will say things like, I'm not sure I want it to go back to exactly how things were. We ate at the same table for the first time in a long time. And that was really valuable. And I want to find a way to maintain that. So, you know, some of those things about, you know, the fact that there are some things about living a quieter life that, that turns out to be to be okay. You know, some things that we want to try to maintain. And even within our own clinical practice, mm-hmm. you know, when, when, when everything first happened, you know, here we were looking into different platforms of what's Zoom and how do we, how do we work that? Now it's kind of a well-oiled machine that we're able to offer services virtually, which even for the Beacon Center means that we're now able to easily um, provide mental health services um, across Newfoundland and Labrador in a way that we weren't able to do before, you know, so we're taking away some of those, um, some of those barriers that we'd had with distance, you know, so even some of those things that are, that are are positives that we want to be able to take us some lessons learned that we can, that we can really use in a helpful way. It's really funny to say that. Like my radio show started the day everything got shut down. I've never recorded an episode <laughs> in the radio station. Now, if somebody is looking at maybe uh, engaging in your new course that you're offering, how can they get involved in that? And also, how can they reach out to your clinic or your group of people if they need some a more formal help? Yeah, sure. So the course that's coming up uh, in April, it's a four-week course. And uh, so it's $50 for the, for the course to register. We, we will offer a course each month. So, you know, each month is kind of set up in its own module. And so we have a website, um, the beaconcenter.ca. So it's just www.beaconcenter.ca, B-E-A-C-O-N-C-E-N-T-R-E.ca. And there's a tab there called courses. And there you can find all the information about courses that we offer and any of the other services, you know, in terms of wanting to get connected for individual services or, or what have you. Um, so that's the way to, to learn a little bit more about, about some of those wellness courses that people can, can look into. And we're just one of, you know, one of many ways that people can, can work on their mental health. So we're happy to be part of the that's larger cool. community. I really enjoyed our conversation today, and I know I'm going to have you back on here because we've already got a new topic hacked out <laughs> between the two of us. That's but, thank right. you, but thank you so much for taking the time to uh, join us today. Thank you so much for having me. I look forward to our next talk. That's Dr. Shannon Edison from the Beacon Center sharing her insights on how our mental health was impacted by the pandemic. When we come back, we'll talk with Jill Whalen, whose online wellness program has shifted thousands of her clients' mindsets around what health and fitness really is. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the show. Today, we're talking about everything that's changed in health this past year. Our next guest is no stranger to the show. Jill Whalen is a wellness coach and has launched a wildly successful online health program that encompasses a balanced approach and challenges the traditional fitness model. She joined me to talk about how the world of fitness has changed last year and what she sees for the future. Hey, Jill, welcome to the show. Hi, Mike. Thanks for having me back. Yeah, I should say welcome back to the show. You were on about <laughs> well, six, seven months ago, but now we're at one year into the pandemic and one year of this show. So I wanted to have you back because you've been at the forefront of a lot of change in fitness and wellness. Thank you. It's been an exciting year for both of us. Congratulations on the one year of your show. We've had an opportunity this year that maybe we haven't had in certain aspects of fitness. And that's what we're going to talk about today is like, how have things shifted and how have things changed? Because we both came from a very traditional fitness background from gyms and personal training and all that stuff. But what are the big things that you've seen change since the start of the pandemic? People are shifting what they're looking for. I think traditionally people want it that idealistic aesthetic that you were that fantasy land thing that everybody wanted and was reaching for and was going through traditional methods to try to obtain. But that 
that posed a lot of barriers for a lot of people. So what we were seeing up to now was so many people who were not accessing wellness information or coaching or sessions at all because of these perceived barriers. And the pandemic, I believe, because things shifted online, it allowed us to smash a lot of those you know, barriers to access to this information and to access to quality and safe information in this industry. That's right. People had a choice to work with whoever they wanted to around the world now, which is really interesting. And it's always been tough for people to get access to a lot of those different things because you have to go to appointment here, you have to go appointment there, you have to go to the gym, you have to do these other things. How has the online environment shifted who's participating? It's really helped people access it when they felt like they probably couldn't before. And whether that was through uh, financial constraints or it was through vulnerability and insecurity, or it was through scheduling, or it was through shift, you know, all of the different things. There's so many different barriers that people see, but having it online and accessible 24 seven, no matter where you are in the world, no matter what level you're beginning at, it's, it makes it so much more accessible to people. And that's what people are starting to see. It's that, like you said, that commute as well. There's the 30 second commute to that room in your house that <laughs> that yeah. you can do your exercise and then stripping it down to basics. For the most part, you don't need a ton of fancy equipment to get yourself a little healthier. That's right. And one of the big things about the gym environment or the traditional sort of fitness thing was the social aspect. But now I think people are getting used to socializing in an online chat room or seeing other faces on a screen. It almost seems normal. I believe that too. And it depends on the people involved and the way that the product is being delivered and all those things too. But if you have connection, Mm -hmm. then you have what you need to help people get toward their wellness. Totally. I I, I mean, we both were personal trainers. Do you think personal training is gone or is it going to change or what do you you think is going to happen going forward? I do think there will always be a place for some sort of bricks and mortar fitness facilities. Absolutely. But I think that people are now searching for something that suits them instead of a cookie cutter, one size fits all approach or necessarily the traditional approach or, 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 you know, doning out tons and tons of money for these hour long sessions. I think now that we have the online global impact that we can have, people can access this in much more productive ways to fit into their lives over the long term too, which is key. Right. Right. And, and so what are the trends you're seeing then? What's going to really shift in the, in the way that people train? I know, like, for example, I know body weight training is bigger now, dumbbell, free weight training, you know, a lot of uh, stretching, online yoga, things like that. But what are the trends that you're sort of seeing from your audience? I'm seeing that people actually like doing this at home because they like doing it when it suits them. There's so many demands every day about around your job and your family and all those other things. But if you can do things at home, it just saves you time, but makes you feel well to do the other things that you need to do. Also, what we're seeing is a a global trend is that people are really investing in what they need to do some work at home this way. And when they have the equipment and they've had this investment done and it's convenient and it's easy and it's fun and it's enjoyable and it's productive, then I don't see this way of wellness going away anytime soon. A lot of people have invested in equipment, so why would they just go from there? We might see a huge sale on Marketplace or something like that of gear, (laughs) but based on how hard it's been to find, I remember I found 20-pound dumbbells, and I was like, I'll take them, and I'm like driving across town to get them as soon as I can, because it was so tough to get it. Um, When when we look at wellness, one of the things as well is, is looking at some of the other barriers people have had. So I know that in the past, I've heard people like, I got to get in shape before I go to the gym, or they don't go to the gym because they feel uncomfortable uh, doing exercises and maybe doing them wrong in front of people that are really fit. What do you think this year has offered us when it came to people improving their literacy? I think it's in, it's given us a big opportunity for personal growth. And a lot of that has been identifying those things within ourselves, those insecurities and little things that we can work on. And I find in my clientele anyways, that they feel so much more safe in this space, in this zone. And as long as they're getting quality access to information where they can learn the exercises properly, then they can do it with confidence because they're in the comfort of their own home and they can develop from there. We, we're very big on technical teaching over over here. And for that reason, they feel confident going through the movements and then we can progress from there. Um, I always say to them, we're going to honor where you're today because without that, we cannot progress. And together we can progress no matter where we start from. Right. And you use a different, you, you use a whole team of people now, right? So what are some of the allied health people that you bring in or, or other people in the fitness and wellness world? Yes. So since things have evolved quite a bit since you and I talked last, but I have my four pillar system to wellness, which is all around movement, mindset, nutrition, and hydration. But I've been trying to build as my community has grown. I've been trying to fit the pieces together to offer like the complete, the 
at the optimal wellness experience. So I've since added things like building on the mindful eating piece. We have cooking classes. We have a clinical psychologist now on board. We have yoga classes. We've had chiropractor do some mobility sessions with us. We have lots to offer now. It's so much more than just the fitness classes. I also do the mindset coaching um, sessions myself as on top of that. And it's just a full community of wellness information. Yeah, I saw you had Doc White on there. He's a good buddy of mine. So yeah, uh, yeah it's a small town, small community of wellness, but it's <laughs> nice to see good people getting together to try and help other people. Um, you know, we're starting to wind up here on this section, but you know, what, what do you think's coming next? Like what's the next sort of thing we can expect to see over the next year as things start to get back to normal? I truly believe you'll see a bit more of the same. People are going to go for a quality experience and people are going to learn, lean more after this global pandemic, going to lean more toward absolute wellness over the long term. And, and people are starting to understand now that that means your mental health, that means your emotional health, that means your physical health, all of those pieces together. That's true. Having balance is critically important. Both of us came from very strong fitness backgrounds, but realizing that there's other elements that need solid attention too. Okay, Jill, it's been a crazy year. The biggest question I think I have when it comes to fitness is what do you think is going to change going forward? Is there going to be new normals? Like what's going to be normal when it comes to fitness? I do think that it's caused people to do a lot of internal reflection. And I think for that reason, that the landscape of the fitness industry and the wellness industry is forever changed in some ways. It's just like September 11th. There's a world before that and a world after and COVID-19 will be the same way. And especially in the area of fitness and wellness. So I think people now have learned what serves them the most, have learned ways to incorporate it into their day, have learned ways to access quality information. And I think going forward, that changes things for the industry. Right. And I think that, you know, uh, we talked about this before, but I think that people have also learned a lot more about how can they exercise? How do they do things properly? How do they think safely? What works for them? Because they've had the comfort of their own home and, and people like yourself that are resources for them to be able to get better. How, how do you think that'll change who's participating in fitness going forward? I, yeah, I don't think that this shift in our industry is necessarily a bad thing. I think people are learning to take a wellness based approach. They're learning that it's not necessarily about reaching some societal ideal. It's more about taking care of themselves from the inside out. And life is so much better when you get there. <laughs> I agree. I agree. Well, thanks so much for sharing it. Congratulations on all your success and ongoing success. Um, I'm sure we'll have you back sooner than later. Thanks so much, Mike. That was Jill Whalen from Whalen Wellness talking about how our approach to fitness and adoption of balance has evolved this year. When we come back, we chat with Dr. Rod Russell, who's a professor of virology and immunology at Memorial University. He'll share everything from how the virus mutated this year to the amazing strides we've made in vaccine development. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Joining us now is Dr. Rod Russell, who's a professor of virology and immunology at Memorial University. He talks about his work, including how the world was able to create vaccines so quickly. He's going to address vaccine hesitancy, and he's also going to talk about why the virus mutated so quickly this year. Let's check it out. Hi, Dr. Russell. Welcome to the show. Good morning. Thanks for having me on. Oh, no problem. It's, it's been great. I know you've been very busy lately. Uh, you study immunology and vaccine development. Uh, can you give us a bit of background on what your research area is and, and how it all works? Yeah, so we've been studying viruses. Um, in my lab, we've been, we've been studying hepatitis C virus for many years, looking at, primarily we were looking at, you know, how the virus replicates what I call target discovery. So trying to find places on the virus and within the virus life cycle to, to develop drugs against. More recently, we've gotten into in, inflammasome stuff. So the in, inflammation that viruses cause and how they cause pathogenesis in the tissues they infect. So when the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic hit and, and we saw this massive inflammation in the lungs, I, you know, I saw right away that this was something familiar and probably similar to what we see with hep C in the liver. So we, we got right into it. That's excellent. And I know you've been busy doing interviews in a lot of different places. Uh, one of the things I think is really important for people to understand is how do vaccines work and, and how does immunology work in general? So the, the whole idea of vaccines and immunology is to sort of give the immune system a taste of, of what might be to come. So 
the idea, it, it's like the immunizations that we get it as kids. Um, the, the immune system can be trained. So it's, it's always ready to respond and react to whatever bug or pathogen, bacteria, virus it comes at it. But, you know, some of these are nasty and can do a lot of damage before the immune system has, has a chance to respond to them. So the idea, of course, behind vaccines is that you, you give the immune system a little bit of the, the bug or a lot of the bug in some cases. Um, and then you make a response so that when you get exposed later, your immune system already has antibodies, T cells, memory B cells, memory T cells that are there ready to respond faster and stronger than they would if it was the first time they saw the, the bug. Right. So it's almost like watching film of the pitcher you're about to you go bat against to, to know what their pitches look like before they come. Exactly. Okay. You do your homework. <laughs> right. And and one of the reasons why this vaccine was developed so quickly is there was a new technology or new a new approach used, um, and it was called RNA vaccines. Uh, what's what does that mean for the future of vaccines? I uh, yeah, I think that actually might. I think the RNA vaccines might be the future of vaccines. Um, when I I teach vaccines, I've been teaching vaccines for years, and back quite a while ago now when the Canadian government announced that they had pre-ordered vaccines from Pfizer and Moderna. I had an interview coming up on, on CBC and um, I knew that I'd be asked about these vaccines and what kind of vaccines they were. So I went and did, you know, did my homework. And the first thing I found is that they were RNA vaccines. And I thought, well, that must be a mistake because I teach vaccines and I don't talk about RNA vaccines. I didn't know what an RNA vaccine was. And I thought it must just be, you know, the, there may be RNA in the vaccine uh, that would normally be made, you know, a viral vaccine like we always talk about. But no, I found out they were actually RNA vaccines. So I had to educate myself and realize that you know, these are literally pieces of RNA. So there's no viral vector. There's no infectious part or anything in there. It's literally a bit of RNA that makes the spike protein wrapped up in a, a nanoparticle that's basically lipids or, or fats. And it's, it's why they're safe, I think, and why they're working so well is because the, it's RNA-based. So they so they really permeate into the cell, and the RNA actually it gives instructions to the cell to develop the immune response that it needs. Correct? Yes. So basically, you know, our cells make RNA um, to make our own proteins, and so what happens with these vaccines is the the RNA gets taken into the cells, and it gets read by our cells. The, the RNA is a code to make proteins, and the proteins are the functional units of everything in our body, really. So the, what happens then is the RNA is the code that makes the protein, and then the immune system says, you don't belong here. Mm. It, it recognizes right away that it doesn't recognize it and says, you're foreign. We don't, we've never seen you before because your immune system is educated to know our own proteins, our own parts of our body, and not to react against them, unless, of course, you have autoimmunity, which is the definition of autoimmunity that we react, re react against ourselves. But normally, the immune system says, okay, that spike protein that was just made from that piece of RNA, that doesn't belong here, antibodies, T cell responses, reaction. So then you get your primary response. And then later, you get your booster if you get a second shot, or if you get the vaccine, uh, the virus, then you make a response against it. Hmm. So it's almost like the cells are practicing being able to create the, the immune response to fight off the virus if it ever enters our system. Exactly. Yeah. That's amazing. But, yeah, but the point is the immune response, the first response, the second response. So when it actually sees the virus later, the second response or third response, if it's two boosters and then a virus exposure, the, each subsequent response is stronger than the ah, first one. Right. So it gets better and better over time. Um, how are they able to manufacture the the specific RNA that makes it produce these proteins? Um, that, I mean, we've been doing that for years. We do that in the lab. It's, it's a simple technique where you, you know, you have a, a piece of DNA that is the code you want to make the, the RNA of, and, you know, you can literally purchase, you know, enzymes that will make the RNA for our, our own research. We, we do it in the lab ourselves. Um, the, the technology for vaccines has actually been around for about 10 years, but, but like many things in science, new things can take a long time to, to get accepted. And I think there was this sort of, oh, you're crazy, you can't make a vaccine out of RNA, and, and sort of, it, it really didn't get, I think it was the scientific community probably didn't accept it very fast, but mm. uh, it, it's been accepted now. And, and I, I actually do think that because the RNA vaccines are faster to make, and because you, you literally just have to enter the sequence into a computer and the machine spits out the, the, the strands of RNA of whatever sequence you want, 
it'll be the fastest way to make vaccines. Wow. Um, and the, the most important thing, in my opinion, is the world right now is worried about variants. So with an RNA vaccine, you just change the sequence that you enter into the computer. And today you have the wild type, tomorrow you have the variant. I envision a day when we have a, a Pfizer or Moderna vaccine that has two, three, four different variants in the same, same, same injection. Hmm, that's really interesting. Um, you know, this virus has changed faster than anybody has predicted. Why did that happen? And, you know, I think you explained how we're, we're potentially able to set up defenses by using these new types of vaccines. But, but why did it evolve so quickly? That's a great question. Um, I mean, we, it's not surprising that, that this virus mutated. RNA viruses like to mutate. It's part of their normal artillery, we'll say. You know, vi RNA viruses, all viruses live in a, in a host, in a human or animal or whatever. All viruses live in another, another uh, living being. So they've adapted. They've had to face immune systems through all time, through evolution or whatever you believe in. But basically... They, they always have to survive in the face of an immune system. So what RNA viruses have done, all of them, is they've, they've basically learned to be sloppy when they replicate. So they, they intentionally make mistakes. Hmm. They all do it. So it's funny for me right now because in some ways people are kind of surprised that this virus is mutating. But any virologist will tell you that's what they do. HIV does it. Flu does it. Hep C does it. All RNA viruses mutate. Some mutate faster than others. Mm -hmm. So it's not surprising that it mutated. Right. I mean, is it potentially because so many people were infected, so there's more of an opportunity for it to transmit, change, and evolve as it went through so many people? Definitely. That's one of the factors. Um, you know, these things mutate as they spread, and they mutate as they replicate. So, you know, any virus that, in, that can infect 100 million people is having a lot of opportunity to, to mutate, spread. People are hesitant of a vaccine, um, and it's really important that we get a large proportion of the population immunized in order for this to be able to stop the pandemic. Is it stronger than you thought it was going to be, the hesitancy? Yes, unfortunately it is. I really, from the beginning, I, I sort of, I was, honestly, I was a little bit skeptical that we would have vaccines as fast as we did, mm -hmm. because I, you know, I was sort of, I thought 18 months, two years, you know, but it was the massive global effort, of course, and, and the, the application of every kind of technology we had that made it happen faster than we thought. But when the vaccines were coming, when we knew they were coming, I, I was overjoyed, of course, but I, I really thought that, you know, this what was going to save the world was the vaccines. What was going to get us back to normal was that, you know, vaccine will come and everybody was calling for it. Everybody was, you know, when are the vaccines coming? When are the vaccines coming? There was this sort of global pressure to hurry up and get the vaccines out. And then they came. And then it's almost like as soon as we got what we wanted, we didn't want it, you know? So mm -hmm. then the, then we had the hesitancy and now the, the numbers, of course, the, you know, the 95 versus the 65 and people saying, Oh, I'm going to wait for the good one. You know, it's, it's unfortunate now that we have the solution to the problem and people are reluctant to, to, to engage it. It blows my mind. Well, so maybe we could talk a little bit about the research side because this is the world we're in. And so we've looked at clinical trials that were really quite large, 40,000 people, but then you look at the world and there's hundreds of millions of people that have been vaccinated. Where do we put our faith in the data at this point? Yeah, we have to put our faith in the real world data. Uh, it, the numbers wise, it, if you added up all of the people who were vaccinated in clinical trials and compared to them to the 360 million, when I checked three or four days ago, it's probably mm -hmm. over 400 million now. Um, people have been vaccinated uh, in the world. It's the real world data just massively outweighs and trumps the, the clinical trial data. So the numbers that we all are sort of fixated on now the 95s you know for the rnas versus the 60 odds you know for the astrazeneca and j and j um these numbers don't matter I, i've been trying to say for a while now that we had to forget about these numbers because they were they were you know controlled little trials where um you know people were monitored closely but in the real world the, the numbers are actually looking better which is phenomenal Mm -hmm. Exactly. And hearing you talk about why it was developed so quickly, why the world was able to get together, what data we should be trusting. This is all stuff that I think is really important for people because they want to be informed about their health. But it, it's very reassuring hearing about this from, from somebody like yourself. Well, thank you so much for taking the time today. Really appreciate it. I learned a lot during this interview. So thanks for taking the, taking the time in your busy schedule. Thanks for having me on. Happy to do it. Well, that's Dr. Rod Russell. 
I'll be posting my full interview with him on The Wall Show's Apple Podcasts and Spotify accounts, as well as VOCM.com in the coming week. So be sure to check that out, as Dr. Russell has some really interesting info to share. When we come back, we'll talk with Dr. Janet Fitzgerald, Newfoundland and Labrador's Chief Medical Officer. We'll be right back after this break. Welcome back. We'll end today's episode with Dr. Janice Fitzgerald, our province's Chief Medical Officer. She's worked tirelessly to help our province navigate the pandemic, and her calm approach has helped ease all of our emotions in the year that tried them. She's also taught us more than we've ever known about public health and what we needed to do to stay safe. In our conversation, we reflected on this past year, including our chat early on in the pandemic. Let's check it out. Hi, Dr. Fitzgerald. Welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me. Well, it's good to see you back here. You were on very early in the pandemic to talk about all the things that were happening here in the province, and now we're a year later. Some some light at the end of the tunnel. So I wanted to get a little update on some of the things that you've seen this year. You know, throughout the year, how have you seen people adapt in this province to the changes that were implemented by public health? I think actually people did really, really well. Um, physical distancing, I think for the most part, people people do understand the importance of that. I certainly see more people cleaning their hands, you know, with hand sanitizer and that sort of thing whenever I'm out. And um, and definitely I was very happy with the way people responded to mask wearing here in the province. You know, I, we've had a good compliance with that. Uh, anytime I'm out, I see a really good compliance with it. and. And I think that uh, people understand the importance of it. And, and so, you know, those things have certainly um, uh, made a difference. And I think people have had to adapt in a lot of other ways as well. You know, they found ways to be able to do their work online. They found ways to be able to shop online, how to get their groceries safely, how to, you know, meet with people online safely and, and just make those connections that they always have. Teachers responded so well being able to teach online. So I really think that uh, on the whole, as a society, we adapted very well. It took took a little bit of time, I'm sure, as it does for any big change like this, but but I think people responded really well. Yeah, yeah. there's been lots of changes. I don't think that'll ever go back to the way that they were before. It's like a new normal, you know? Uh, I really hope people wash their hands a whole lot more. <laughs> well, actually, you know, that, that takes us to a question right here. You know, you know, what are some things that we learned now that will be helpful in the future? Like I know flu was down across the country this year and in particular in this province as, t- as well. Yeah, it was. And, uh, you know, part of that was there's there's few reasons. Part of it was because of all those measures that we put in place that prevent it from spreading. You know, schools were probably not in to the same degree that they were. And that made a difference, but also just people keeping their distance, washing their hands, wearing masks, that that really does make a difference for the transmission of these respiratory diseases. And, and then we also saw that all the way around the world. So, you know, our, our flu doesn't come from nowhere. It doesn't just appear. It comes from um, uh, other parts of the world that experience their flu outbreaks and it moves through. So we don't have people traveling and we don't have that in importation and then your rates kind of go down. So, I mean, there's, it's, it's a bit complicated as to why, but yeah. certainly um, I think a lot of these measures, these personal measures that we've done have contributed. That's great. And we, and we had Minister Hanke on talking about the flu vaccines here in the fall. So that was also a thing that I think people were really active in getting uh, involved in. And that's sort of been a trend, really, is that the pe- public has been on board. For example, this this most recent circuit breaker that's now you know going to come to an end, I have an impression, at least it felt like to me, that people were were able to adopt uh, it very easy compared to before. Did you guys get the same impression? Um, it certainly seems like people pivoted very quickly, but I think people knew what to expect and been through it before. Hopefully it was a bit shorter, so it was a bit easier to, to uh, tolerate. But yeah, I think for the most part, people really understood the importance of not, uh, not getting out and, and, you know, having, reducing those contacts and, and really, uh, really looking at uh, how to reduce their risks. So, so I think people did step up very well here, for sure. 
another thing that we were able to do, uh, in particular, it may have been the frequency that people were hearing from you, but you were able to build a lot of trust with the public. And that trust wasn't there in some parts of Canada and lots of parts of the world. Why were we able to build more trust here in the public health system than maybe other places? Uh, so I think I think Newfoundlanders have trusted public health for a long time. You know, we see that in the uptake of childhood vaccinations. Everybody, um, you know, we have the highest rates in the country of childhood vaccines, and everybody knows their public health nurse, right? Mm-hmm. That's so. In a lot of places, public health nurses don't necessarily do uh, vaccines, so um, or childhood vaccines. So, you know. We have that relationship. Public health has that relationship with with people and with communities. We have public health nurses who go into schools, and and so I think there's there's an inherent trust that's there to start with. Number one, I think that Newfoundlanders, by and large, appreciate the the importance of these public health measures. There's a lot of Newfoundlanders around who still remember uh, tuberculosis and what that did, uh, to this province, you know, and, and I think that, uh, there is that understanding that we all have to work together in order to be able to combat a, a significant disease. So, so we have that. And then I think, and I, and I believe actually we talked about this before the last time we actually had a conversation, uh, was that we had really good political support here mm. and, uh, you know, the decision makers, trusted public health, they were on side with public health, and they they really took seriously public health's recommendations. Uh, but not only that, the opposition party and the NDP, they were all on board in the in, you know, from the early stages. So they understood the importance of the public health measures and they understood the importance of how public health had to approach things. And so that united front really did make a difference. And and I think, you know, that was really important for our response. So we don't see that necessarily in other parts of the world as, you know, I don't need to, I don't need to to illustrate that for anyone, but. No, that's right. And that's a, that's a great point. It was based in facts, it was based in science, it was based in best practice. And really that seemed to make a huge difference for people because there was no conflicting information, which made your message so much clearer. The next hurdle that you're facing right now is the vaccine rollout. First of all, how do we see this panning out? And secondly, what do we need to do in the interim to make sure that until we're all vaccinated, we stay safe. So we certainly, um, you know, we're starting in, into phase two. And uh, with that, we hope we'll be able to get through uh, phase two, certainly by um, the end of May. And, uh, you know, maybe a little earlier than that, but certainly by that time, because so much depends on when we get vaccines. And, you know, we we have delays all the time that uh, can happen. And, and that's just, unfortunately, that's just the way it is at this point. But um, but we do have, um, uh, certainly we hope that by the end of June, we'll be able to offer vaccine to everyone who wants it, every adult who wants it, everyone who's eligible. And then, you know, we'll be starting to work on second doses by that time as well. So, you know, our goal really is to, to get as many people vaccinated as we can. We'd love for everybody to be able to get the vaccine uh, for those who can, obviously there's some people who may have you know, sensitivities and, uh, and that sort of thing and won't be able to. But our goal would be to get as many people vaccinated as we can and uh, and for that to be done by the end of June. Certainly from an appointment point of view, it may take a little bit longer to actually get needles and arms. And in the meantime, I think it's really important for people to remember to maintain those public health measures. So to, you know, make sure you're keeping your distance, washing your hands, that sort of thing. Uh, we're learning more and more all the time about how this vaccine is affecting transmission. And in the next couple of months, certainly, we will, we will have more information on that. You know, there are some countries that have been able to manufacture their own vaccines, and so they're a little further ahead of us. And, um, and we're seeing information coming from those countries now about rates of um, symptomatic disease and that sort of thing. And that's all very reassuring that this vaccine, these vaccines are doing the job. But we will, you know, we will have to ask people to be patient for a little bit longer. It's... Uh, we really want to make sure that we have that good information before we before we change things. 
Yeah, that makes perfect sense. And that's the way, you know, one, one thing we've got the benefit of, uh, we were one of the last people to get hit by it in Canada because it came west to east. Yeah. Uh, and so we do have a bit of time to be able to best practice off these other countries, for example, like Israel, which has almost 100% inoculation right now. If there if there's a message you want to uh, leave folks with, because we're winding down here now, is there anything else you'd like to say before we, we close this up? I mean, it's been a heck of a year. Uh, lots of changes. You've been very busy. You're definitely one of the most well-known people in the province now, if not the most well-known. <laughs> so any, anything, uh, you know, you want to, you want to share? I'd like to thank everybody for stepping up and doing what needed to be done uh, to help us control this. We've been very lucky so far and I'll knock on wood as I say that. And, um, you know, we haven't had to bear some of the things that other places have. And so that is in no small part due to, um, you know, what we've been able to accomplish here as a province. So, uh, you know, as a, as a community. Um, so I would like to thank everybody. And we are seeing a light at the end of the tunnel now with the vaccines. And it's a, just a little bit longer. And we'll have that uh, first shot offered to everybody. And we hope that by that time, things will be changing and we'll have more information and be able to make some recommendations about some of these public health measures. So I think we need to be hopeful, but at the same time, we need to be realistic and uh, continue on with, you know, all those things we know that work uh, to reduce the spread of this disease for now. But I'm very hopeful for the future and uh, we just need to hang in there a little bit longer. We're almost there. Well, well, thank you to you and your teams. I know everybody in your teams are working really, really hard with all the all the yeah, help indeed. you've been giving everybody. And so we all really appreciate that. Thanks for taking the time today. It's great to see you. Thank you. Take Bye. care. Thank you to all of my guests for joining me today and sharing their unique perspective on how their areas of health have evolved in such a challenging year. For all of you out there, I hope you've learned something new this year by tuning into the show, and I look forward to diving even deeper into our health as we continue our journey this year. Well, that's today's episode. I'm your host, Dr. Mike Wall. We'll see you back here next week for another episode of the Wellness and Healthy Lifestyle Show on your VOCM. <laughs>